welcome Daphne and Megan to the Femsplainers. Thank you. Thank you. I, I, I see Happy here. Well, to our listeners who are not going to be watching this or hearing this on, um, on YouTube, Megan's in a very rural farmhouse in Virginia. I'm up by a lake in Canada, and you, Daphne, hung in in New York City, looks like. Yes. Not totally uh, willingly, but I'm here. Yeah. Well, yeah. We, we, th we, were, we were talking just before you came on that, that really the topics we wanted to cover today, uh, especially including your new novel, uh, 22 Minutes of Unconditional Love, really revolves around sexual obsession. Um, and one of the things I found so interesting about your novel, which um, I, I, I think is marvelously written and, and, and just you. gripping, it's, it's also like a novel that... I miss the kind of novel that I miss because I read a lot of these types of sort of literary, women's literary, not just women's, but, you know, literary novels that featured a lot of sex and some philosophy and, 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 you know, good education of book reading, little aperçus, doesn't it? Right. And I, and I miss Sex among that. smart people. Sex yes. among smart people. Um, Yes, I'm usually on the upper east side. Long lost. And, and I was <laughs> upper just like, west wow, side. I love this. I love this. But it was also, as we know, very sexually graphic. But again, in a way that was not sort of, you know, whatever, Fifty Shades of Grey, just sort of porn or cheesy. It was, it was really true and real. So, but we also know that it took you like 30 years to write this. So, Daphne, why did it take you so long? Partly because I'm a staggering procrastinator, <laughs> partly because I got the contract to write this novel 30 years ago. I don't know if anyone remembers the press. It was called Poseidon. Mm -hmm. I think they, they published Mary Gateskill. And I got the advance by describing what I wanted to write about to two editors there and I said I was curious to I wanted to write about a woman who got involved in a if you want to call it sadomasochistic or I wanted once to call the book bad taste the book had many <laughs> titles the first one was the discovery of sex for many years which I decided was too frontal and I said that in these novels where a woman gets obsessed, like even Anna Karenina, they end up committing suicide. Nine and a half weeks, she ends up, I think, being implicitly hospitalized. Uh, no spoilers. And I thought to my, okay. <laughs> I thought um, no one has written, a lot of women, I, hope, I think, I don't hope, I think get involved in relationships that are like not good for them. They can't all end up dead or institutionalized. So I wanted to try and write a novel about how does a woman eventually get out of this, especially if it's sexually addictive. But after I signed the contract, I got to page 212, where not to give too much away the narrator who, I re who, as usual, everyone would read as me, is asked to crawl across the floor. Ooh. I stopped dead. The publisher liked it a lot, my editor. I come from an Orthodox Jewish family. I kept thinking, what are the women in the women's section going to think of me? My father was the founder of the synagogue. My whole family is modern Orthodox. I am strayed, I mean, not there. And I just felt I wasn't up to the mixture of outrage. Um, why is she writing about these perverted longings? I mean, I also grew up in a background where sex is kept not hidden like the Hasidic community. Right. 
but downplayed. And we are supposed to be very community minded, you know, not write about things that would cast a shadow on the Jewish community. Um, I pulled the novel back. I tried over the years to rewrite it, not hundreds of ways. I tried writing it in what I thought of. I had read a writer named Annie or no, who I like a lot. So after I read her, she wrote a book called Simple Passion that I wrote about for the New Yorker and I loved it. So then I tried what I called my French period in which I would write very sparingly. I changed it from first person to third person. I kept getting new book contracts. So along the way, I paid back hundreds of thousands of dollars. Oh my God. Finally, I let, I let it go and went on to write a lot of journalism. Then I wrote a memoir about my experience with depression, but my publisher had bought this book as part of a four book contract. So I supposedly owed it. Uh. And then I thought if I don't finish this novel, I sound like, what's it called? When you keep crying and, and there's no one there, you know, you keep crying wolf. Oh, you're crying so, wolf, yes. So I, about two years ago, when Me Too had just broken out, I went back to it, changed it a lot. It's, it's told retrospectively, the woman is out of it and married and pregnant with a second child, but she looks back on this sexually exciting, dominant affair. I was sufficiently, I, I mentioned Danielle, I don't know, Megan, if you ever saw it, but I wrote an op-ed two years ago about Me Too in the Times. What women, really, what women really say as opposed to what they think, what they really think. Mm -hmm. That was a classic of the genre. Right. It and was. Was it? Well, no one ever else. I think ever, so. No one else ever wrote a negative piece in the Times. Yeah. Yeah. Like no, it was too. a very, and it was early. It was. I didn't realize. Yeah, January 2018. You, you, you like came out there when everybody was still very starry eyed about all of this. What? You, you went on with Barry Weiss. Barry Weiss was your editor on that piece? Am I yeah, that right? went on, yeah. Um, and you went on MSNBC or something like that, or one of those. Program right, to watch. right. And, and um, maybe since I'm not Twitter connected at all, I feel if I were connected to Twitter, I wouldn't write half the stuff I write yes. because there is a vindictive groupthink mass out there waiting to attack. Um, I felt really strongly about it. I felt the women I knew, they can all be atypical, even like very strong feminists, like uh, Carol Gilligan. We were talking about how half of it was vindictive. How could you put together a Harvey Wein and someone who said you look good in your skirt? But I, that was the same period in which I decided to go ahead with the novel and finish it. I did consider at a friend's suggestion, acknowledging me too, and saying I had put the book away. But in the end, I said it before me too, mm -hmm. anyway. And I don't know if that helped me finish it, but I wanted to write it, whether it was of the moment or not. Well, it's interesting that you were, that was the catalyst to finish it, uh, because I think a lot of us awakened from into, this, and that's why we started the, the, the Femsplainers, was sudden this fervent new, both energy and challenge to feminism and, and women's rights um, and sex. And um, I'm interested how it pr provided you the catalyst, because the themes or, or the characters which are involved, I don't want to say sadomasochistic because that would put it in a kind of 50 shades of gray. It's, I'm sorry, he, your character is in love with a m mentally masochistic 
Can we just yeah. say jerk? Right. I can't. Bit of an asshole. And I think that's a very toxic. common. He was toxic before the, his time. But, but yet, right. but his allure, right. you know, the bad boy, blah, blah, blah. He was very, I think every young woman, and, and, and it's written in the context of 28 to 30 year old woman. Um, every woman has had that relationship, I think. Every yeah. woman has experienced that kind of draw to the wrong person, the man who seems to understand her, the man yeah. who just sexually ravages her in ways that are almost unspeakable. Right. And, and, and so how does, I mean, it, to read that post V2, where we can't now, along with COVID, even watch movies where People are hugging each other. <laughs> what, right. what was the catalyst, no. the creative catalyst? Well, it's, interesting. It's, it's interesting that you, it was important to me to not make it physically sadomasochistic mm -hmm. because I don't think you can call psychological... I mean, you need, as a woman, as a young woman, a certain amount of masochism and maybe self-dislike to get involved with a jerk who happens to be sexually experienced. So I think it does require a certain giving up of power. But I think the, the Me Too movement with its depiction of women as solely the objects of predatory men as not having any sexual desire of their own that seemed to be written out of Me Too. Um, to me, the victim predator paradigm so reduced relations between men and women. I think I also said in the piece, I found it a throwback to more um, you know, times when we were more condemning of sexual life. It just made me think, truthfully, I had to finish the book anyway, but it also worried me that someone called me Monday morning at eight and said, you got a rave in the Times. And I said, no, I didn't. I hadn't read it. I kept thinking it was going to be given to some woke, rapidly woke, yeah. probably should all be excised, um, millennial who would tear it apart limb by limb. I also think Me Too doesn't allow in like all movements, people have different configurations, different unconscious lives, different modes of desire to put it all down as the woman is basically chaste, to use the Me Too word, agency-less. And this is all about the man being the complete initiator. Doesn't strike me as honest. Mm -hmm. So that was part of my, what impelled me. It, it's funny you used the word power a minute or so ago. And I feel like that's a word that has just been it's at once been fetishized and completely diluted. It's constantly uh, used in the context of, well, there is, there is a power hierarchy that is fairly static across populations, across situations. And you know, the fact is that power is fluid. It's constantly shifting between people. So there does exactly. seem to be, in a lot of the Me Too discussions, the premise is that the man by definition has more power than the woman by definition. Right. And it's so limiting. And uh, no, I think, I think it's really true. Yeah. And the thing with that kind of relationship, I mean, I, I, first of all, let me just say, I love the book. It was, I, I loved it on so many different levels, including like the time and the place. So I, we'll, I wanna get to yeah. that, but yeah. you know, just that kind of relationship, we have all had that, maybe more than one time, you know? And it's like part of the allure of it is that this guy is sort of, abusing you in a way emotionally or psychologically whatever but there is a feeling of power to be derived from that sort of energy you right. have an idea about yourself he makes you feel 
differently about yourself or like a different kind of person or a more dramatic person or a more daring person. And there's power in that, that I think you can take with you into the future and use for your own good. I agree. I think one other part of it for me was obses obsession by its nature. I mean, ultimately jerk that he is, he's obsessed with her. Mm -hmm. Right. At least sexually. And that makes you the object of constant attention. Mm -hmm. Most people don't walk around being on someone else's mind all the time. And that was something that this woman, I'm not saying me, I mean, she's partly me, wanted for whatever reason. That she, I think somewhere I say she wants to be in a kangaroo pocket, kangaroo's pocket. But isn't that also That's true? It's a great it's, metaphor. We're, we're, but it's a, it's, a, it's a universal metaphor too, because I think, and this is where the Me Too movement doesn't take in to account, as any movement really can't, the messiness of emotions True. and human lives and experience. And, and it's not a one size fits all. And I think what you captured, um, that women want a man who is confident, but they also have a desire to be taken care of. And so when such a powerful male figure as this character was, even though like your, your fictional friend Celia could just see the alarm, you know, your friends all go, hey, that guy's trouble, you gotta get away from him. But that, that sense of, um, I, want, I want to be loved like a woman, but I also wanna be kind of taken right. care of because I want love and, and I love this man's confidence, which I think is a real problem for younger women today and the men out there, women are scared to want that kind of desire that. and sex and, and you men are afraid to give it or act like, anyway. That, men are really afraid to offer it. Right, yeah. right. They freak out if you, you know, demanded something like that. For um, good reason. Do you remember <laughs> the age? It was the 90s or the two early aughts, as it's called, when they, there was this whole evolution of sweet men Mm. Everyone talked about men. Mm. I don't remember that. Men should be sweet, except no one was interested in them. The nice guy <laughs> problem? Was it the yes. nice guy problem? That's an eternal problem, but yes, there was, there was both Peter Pan's were became in the 80s, which are, I think all men, I shouldn't say that, many men today are Peter Pan's in the sense that nobody yes. is growing up on time. Um, no. <laughs> 18 is the new 20. 28, which is the new 38. But it's also, and Megan, you've talked, I think we've talked about this when you were on the podcast, but as a general thing, also see our views of Me Too and sex are very generational. Um, as you pointed out, Daphne, you were worried, uh, woke, meaning some 24-year-old was going to review this book and, and tear it apart. Why do you think, I mean, it's a little funny to be grandma, as it were, you know, to these young and saying, you guys don't have enough sex. You don't know what passion is, you know. Uh, don't you like it when a man rips off your clothes? I mean, they think we're insane when, when we, we say that. They, 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 how did this happen? <laughs> why, why are we, now, you know, why is there this tension? Yeah. I think there's so many things in play. So wait, Daphne, I want to ask you, is the book set in the 80s or the 90s? 90s. The 90s, okay. That's what I thought. So, and that's part of the reason that it was so delicious to me because I was in my 20s in the 90s for like the entire 90s. I was 20 in 1990. Right. So I, you know, and I actually had this revelation recently where, you know, people used to say, you know, people complain about how terrible the world is for women, et cetera, et cetera. And I would say something like, well, would you rather be a woman today in 2020 or in 1920? Oh, okay. But you know what? I actually think it might've been better to be a woman in 1990 than in 2020. 
because there was, it was like, there was this sweet spot. We, we had all our rights and we were empowered and we were taking over the world, et cetera. But social media hadn't come along. Well, digital media hadn't come along. There was not this ubiquitous online pornography. It was really a, a something to behold. There wasn't this extreme hyper femininity that I think is a real tyranny with these women now. And I think that's what's causing a lot of this. So I actually, you know, I've been thinking about this for several years and, and I have become more generous um, toward younger people in my thinking because like it's it's really hard right now to, to right. navigate these waters. Well, there was a piece, I didn't think it was, I shouldn't go into my critical self that it wasn't so well done, but it was on, it was well done, let me say that. It was in the Atlantic on how few women are having sex. Yes, it was Kate yeah. Julian. She was on the she was on the pod. We discussed that. Yes. It was a great piece. Yeah. And I read it and thought there's something sad about all this. It's so sad. Because because first of all, I think I wrote in my Me Too piece, if consent is so part of the package it's a little like mother may you know that old game mother you know may, may i take the next step yeah affirmative consent is a big mother may i game i mean right who is going to find it seductive even among 20 30 years old 30 year olds for a man to say may i kiss you i mean yes in the beginning maybe you know if you're not you've done not you've not kissed but to ask about every step to yeah. me would seem inherently about as erotically exciting <laughs> as a putting together something from know. ikea <laughs> does this go here oh my gosh no wonder they never get it done yes right. there's no, no completing it but, but do you is do you think that they really do that? This is the thing. No, like, no. is that really question, going on in all their sexual encounters? I think the problem well, is we wouldn't. Know. There aren't sexual encounters. Is the problem that like that's right. there? Yeah. There aren't as many. I, I'll put in an ad for the '80s too, and I think that it was sort of great to be a, a young woman. Is I I think because we were still riding on '70s feminism. We were still working out the repercussions of the sexual revolution and how they weren't always going to redound to our favor, but, but yet you still had that headiness of female empowerment, but men and women and being separate genders and sex being exciting and something you didn't have to feel ashamed of. And that, it, it's like the me too, I guess just as 70s feminism reflected its time, there's something very law-like and bureaucratic and politically correct about the Me Too movement in its demands for, as you say, those direct, you know, levels of consent and legalistic, I guess is the word I want. It's also, I think, a return to Puritanism. Mm -hmm. It's a very puritanical approach. I mean, I don't think erotic life is meant to be dictated or prescribed. And I think the minute you do that, which Me Too has partly succeeded in doing, it denudes it of individuality. Um, there's some sense of disapproval mm -hmm. of sex underneath it all. I have felt, you know, it's not directly stated, but it's a little a return to women who were like, you know, Victorian creatures wearing crinolines who would faint at the idea of sex. And we're in constant jeopardy from, yes. from men yes. in the world. But Daphne, like, where do you think it comes from? What's the root cause? I somewhat think Danielle has a point. I, I think there's a point. I think it's a, an almost unconscious rebellion or argument with the sexual revolution mm -hmm. that somehow it didn't serve women. I think 
it's a slight, since a lot of these younger women, I mean, a few of them have said to me, no, I would never call myself a feminist. Is it distancing from feminism? But I think feminism was seen as in and of, in and of itself suspect because it um, didn't get rid of men. Mm -hmm. It tried for more egalitarianism, which got, I think, mutated into women would dictate it. But I don't know if that explains, I'm never clear myself. I think it originated obviously in Hollywood, which is always known as having a casting count, as we all know. Right. That was part of Hollywood. Women are hired for their looks primarily. I always think of Marilyn Monroe because she fascinates me, who was always accused of sleeping her way to the top and her agent, Johnny Hyde, she was involved with till his death. But I don't know if I find it so shocking, Hollywood. Women are objectified, to use an old fashioned term, in Hollywood terms. I think it began there. With well, it began in nature. It began with, with bio I mean, Hollywood is a reflection of, right. of nature. I mean, women are valued when they're young. I mean, I, I hate to sound like an evolutionary psychologist, but there's certainly some, there's evolutionary biology for starters. So I, I am always curious, there, it's almost like there's this project now to socially engineer things out of the culture that are really just in our DNA. Great. And it's, it's frustrating because you can't say, you know, you can state a fact uh, that we all wish were not the case, but it's true. Stating the truth of something is not the same as endorsing it. And that's a distinction that is often lost. And also something you said, I find in, I think the culture has become more obsessed, whether it's through the complete darkness of Jeffrey Epstein, Epstein's approach, obsessed with young women. I think Not, that's always been true. <laughs> but more than ever, I, if it's more than ever, I wanna hear because I feel like I've, no, I'm noticing it more than ever, but that's because I'm not young anymore. <laughs> I think it's Danielle, I mean, I, this is my take on it, watching the world. Very rich men, mostly invariably you read, are with a woman 30 years younger. Yes, for sure. Not every, right. um, I'm not sure women themselves having contributed to this because nubileness starts ever earlier with, and I think the whole, not to sound too convoluted, I think the whole um, waxing, whatever they do these days, what did they used to call it when a line was left? You know- Oh, the treasure trail or the landing strip? Right. <laughs> There's a number of terms. <laughs> on, um, not, I don't know why I know them. No. On, <laughs> so, so, now we know, Megan. <laughs> Yes. Oh, it's not the treasure trail. <laughs> Sorry, that's something else. Yeah, that's, that's something. Yeah. The, land, the landing strip, yes. Yes. Right. I think that's women colluding, truthfully, in making themselves prepube prepubescent. Oh, yeah. You take away the signs of being a, a mature, a woman who has developed sexually, and you leave her sort of androgynous, young. Danielle, I know you don't, I, I don't think it was as extreme in the 80s and 90s that the younger you got, the better. Well, a, 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 a couple of thoughts. I, I think a part of that is the, the, the part you're talking about infantilizing or making women look like androgynous young boys. I think that comes from the impact of gay culture on fashion. That if you look at it and who are styling and who is doing the styling, um, I think that had a lot to do with that. As with sex, I think the backlash is the sexual revolution, as great as it was to be a 23-year-old woman and say, I can do what I want, um, 
it, 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 it severed responsibility from the man that, that he used to only be able to have this kind of sex or level of sex if he was, you know, respectably without going, that's why they had, you know, as I think you wrote about in your book, the prostitutes to take care of the more carnal desires of men. But if you wanted a respectable woman, you had to give something back. And, and as for younger women and rich men, I used to tell, you have, you have, do, you have a daughter, Daphne, right? Yeah. I mean, I, yeah. I, I would tell them, if you are an attractive 22, 23 year old, in terms of sexual power, you are a billionaire. Like women and men have, like the guy's money is his power, even if he's 55 or whatever. And the woman, a 23 year old woman, who is even moderately Cash. attractive is a, a, at least a millionaire, you know? And she has such sexual power to wield. And I think there's sensed a loss of that, that we don't have that, that we, we have, we're all liberated to have sex, but it leads to nothing except broken hearts or obsessive uh, romances or, or no sex at all. Like, like I think there's, the broken promise of it is sex has ceased to be fun and exciting and novel. It's, it's something that's scary if you're a 20, 18 or 22 year old woman. And right. so, and, and right. you don't want to have these kinds of relationships. So just best to avoid it and watch, you know, the housewives yeah. series at home. It's, yeah. it's, that's what's worrisome. I think. I think one point you brought up that isn't brought up enough. I've written a lot, a lot about fashion. Mm -hmm. And I remember when I went to Paris to see the 25th anniversary of Chanel. And I sat in a room with Karl Lagerfeld. Oh, wow. And a model came out and I was in a state of disbelief. I said, how old is she? Yeah. She was barely developed. She was neo-anorexic. I think hot high-end fashion designs for enormously thin, preferably unchesty women. And it's made the female model so unwomanly. Yes. Because a lot of that has been X'd out. Right, no breasts, but that, no hair. I think that's the, the yeah, the, the the androgy looking like an adolescent boy in high fashion is the standard and has been for a long time but we have this reaction to it now where we have the extreme curviness the, the kind of online hypersexuality and it's i a kardashian model but it, it, right but it's funny because you know there is a sort of body positivity aspect to that but it's also really unattainable in a completely different sort of way and it's also just as desexualized as the flat chested boy model. So it's like, it's kind of just two sides of, you know, different sides of the same coin. Yeah, I like also think, sorry, yeah, go ahead, sorry. go ahead. No, I was thinking what Megan's referring to, to me, the idealized, ideal woman now, I was thinking about Kate Hudson, how they all have breast implants. Yep. They're tiny in every way, and then have gazooming breasts. And a gazooming posterior. That's the Ooh. thing that freaks me out. Well, I was in LA and I saw now. my first butt implants in a woman. And it was <laughs> very obvious. I mean, it's like fake breasts, except it's down there. She was wearing yoga pants and it, it, was, it was freakish. It was like a cartoon of a woman. It was like some old Looney Tunes thing where they do the exaggerated behind and then the exaggerated front. And it was, but it was as every, in every way a bit misogynistic. Like I, I used to think, I, I think of those young boy images of women in fashion as, as, as a kind of misogyny that, 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 <laughs> that some of these designers are taking out yeah. on women. They're trying to make you look as ugly and unfeminine as possible. Right. And then you have this other extreme that is like a cartoon of femininity, and it's totally. misogynist. Well, I too. saw it. I saw it up totally. I saw it up front and close because of the many odd things I've written about. 
I wrote about the Kardashians. You, you, I I, we could spend hours. I want to hear like all of your life, all of the people you've met, but sorry, but go on. Yes. Right. What okay. did you say about the Kardashians? I didn't see that one. I did one piece where I went out to Calabasas where they live mm -hmm. and met the killer mother, Chris, who is responsible for their success. And what did he used to be? Bruce? Bruce, Caitlin, Caitlin, don't, don't, don't dead name, don't dead name. Don't dead we'll name. Canceled. We'll be canceled. But I came, oh, he was, was yet Bruce. Okay, he was then Bruce, okay, fair. But I remember coming home and saying to my closest friend, I know this sounds nuts, but I think he's becoming a woman <laughs> because he seemed so feminized. But then I was asked to write a piece about Kim yeah. And it was for Elle, and they wanted to try and dress her elegantly, which is hardly her trademark. Right. I was in a studio with her. She walked around, if not totally nude. I have never seen in my life, whatever word you want to use, a butt like that. It was... It's not it natural, a, right? It's acting. not, it's not no. of birth. No. It was never though, but she had some, she had some material to work with. But, though, but to right? have a waist I mean, like this and then hips like I this agree. and then go in again, hu human bi That's biology can't attain that naturally. What, no, so what, what was I it like? Know. What did it look like naked? If that doesn't sound pervy to ask. I'm curious. No, I looked, I looked very hard myself. <laughs> it looked what you're saying not Cupid doll, but like a parody. And I agree with Danielle. I don't think, I'm not sure Megan, she had all that to work with because the figure, the body goes completely in mm. the waist and suddenly kazooms out. It looked to me unwieldy. You could never make her look elegant because it was a sort of if this is what men like, it was a sort of tawdry dream woman. Mm -hmm. And in her case, it was so disproportionate. I think she had some of it taken out. Yeah, well, like I the Elizabeth, that. was it the Elizabethans who came really in and, and would even want to remove ribs oh, and then, and then come out like, and, like yeah. Chesterfields or whatever. They, like, so it, it's, it's sort of like a modern version of, of that, but... Yeah, definitely. I can't think very comfortable to walk around in, but um, definitely. But it's it's so weird too. Oh no, go ahead. No, no, go go, Megan, because I was going to move on oh, to. Oh no, just really oh, quickly, yeah. I was. Okay. Oh well. I, <laughs> Speaking of celebrities, I mean, it just seems odd that like to make to make yourself look this way because that's what pleases men, and then by definition, if you look that way, you can't be taken seriously. If, if you're incapable of being elegant or looking professional or whatever it is, it's like such a bind, so, so to speak, right? Like it's, it, it's, I don't know, it was just a thought I had. Like you really can't win. Well, it's also, it's no. like we're trying to acknowledge your sexual power in this cartoonish way. And yet, yeah. if, and then, but then don't let anyone seduce you. Like I'm, I'm not using this sexual power to get male attention, okay? It's, it's me. Right, I, I, it's, I, I own it, right. Yeah, I own it. I, I, own I, it. I chose my choice. Yeah. That yeah. whole word that came into, I don't know when it came into endless repetitive usage was this objectification, mm -hmm. the male gaze. Remember, mm -hmm. it was all right. the fashion right. to talk endlessly about the male gaze. To me, it's also what about the woman who wants to elicit the male gaze? The male gaze isn't all a violation. I remember because I just was going through ancient papers and found when I was at Barnard, I wrote a lot of poetry and there was a poem called In Praise of Wolf Whistles, in which I said I liked being leered at. I, I wrote, I wrote, I, I used to edit a magazine and 
a woman named Ann Muggridge, uh, daughter-in-law of the late Malcolm White, wrote an essay for Malcolm, my magazine yeah. called In Praise of the Wolf Whistle, too. It, it was, it yeah, was, I've had many students write that piece yeah, in no, recent was, years, too. But it was, it was not this, I mean, it's, look, it can be intimidating and horrible and leering, and nobody yeah. likes that. But for her, oh. and I think, what, Daphne, what you saw, it's, she, she said, she wrote that she only got it wolf whistled when she was like very young, but also she was emotionally happy. Like she was walking down the street right. in that way that only a young a no. woman can do. And, and, it, and it was a kind of acknowledgement of the whole, not just her ass or something, but the whole beautiful female youthful spirit. Uh, yeah, no, you right. can't say that now. That's super. No, and I also think you're correct. You don't get wolf whistles if you're desolate. You know, <laughs> desolately walking down the street, no one is going to, yeah, no, I guess now um, that's all, not whatever they say, water under the bridge. I mean, but I've had, sorry, I've heard young, I've had young women tell me that there's a sort of competition among each other. They complain about being catcalled on the street, but it's also a subtle way of letting, it's a humble brag. It's letting it be known that you were, Right. Russell that and yes. they're sort of keeping track. <laughs> well, it's funny about all this. I, took, I taught a class at Columbia's MFA program last year, which many people said to me, how did you get this course through? It was called The Literature of Eros. Mm. And I think I began the class in my somewhat contrarian, confrontational way. And I said, this is a class about reading erotic literature. So I would like to leave terms like consent, the whole vocabulary of political correctness aside. One woman left the class, it was the first class. And they all also wrote about sex essays. Megan, you must have had, now I thought- I probably had some of the same students. <laughs> yeah. I thought it was, there were two themes a sort of indifference about the boyfriend, and then enormous, uh, uh, when, when there was a faculty meeting and you were supposed to say what you got from the class, I said, I discovered that the new foreplay is choking. They were oh my God. choking each other. What? It's terrible. That's from the, that's from the, um, that's from the pornography. Yes. Really choking? Never I heard of it until my students, it's true. These are, yes. these are it's all these over the are, place. I want to say normal students. These are like people you see yes. walking down the street and suspect not those nice lady, young women of the Upper East Side are, well, a, are facing choking yeah. now. Is that right? Oh my God. I mean, I would God. say five out of a majority wrote about that without any affect also. It wasn't, oh, he tried to choke me and I was horrified. It happened as part of the ongoing seduction. And I thought yeah. to myself, is this an improvement? No. So you mean that it was written almost with detachment? It was like, yeah. as if this is just what happens. We went to the movies, we had popcorn, we kissed in the car afterwards, and then he choked me, and then I went home. Like, well, it's, one, it's kind of part of that? foreplay. It's one of the bases. You know, okay, so that, you know, oh it's like God. second base, it's, it's, you know, second base, is it third base? <laughs> I don't know. It's like it's third a and a half It's a different base. game. I, it sounds more like hockey. When they're <laughs> fighting. This is like they changed the rules of baseball. There's I, a, you know, designated hitter. I, now I feel really you know, old. I, it comes, well, I feel old too, but this comes from online pornography and it's hugely, uh, it's just de rigueur. And a lot of the campus sexual assault cases revolve around that particular right. action. I believe that the um, Emma Silkowitz, the woman who was, you know, carrying the mattress around, I think part of her claim uh, involves that that right. activity. Yeah. Well, and now, and here we're sitting. I mean, I'm so naive. Here we're sitting, wondering why. Why do young women want to have more sex? And like, oh, because aside from you know, pornographic levels of oral sex that they are now expected to provide. They also get to get choked. So maybe it's not such a I mystery. Think, I think also, what was that book I read? It was excellent. Sorry. The hookup culture. Yes. Basically 
goes against romance and For sex sure. being aligned. So if you're completely, first of, I mean, that book argued, which I think I agree with, that women still romanticize sex. Maybe, Megan, you've met, still think sex is about something more than... But they can't admit it. It's unfeminist to admit that. Right. For sure that's true. Right. No, and that's what you were saying. Yeah. Like, you can't, or Megan, you were saying, like, you can put out rules and platitudes and everything, but you, we are going through this more than ever transformational idea of gender and trying to deny, you know, white is white, black yeah. is black. It, it, it's, it's, it's bizarre. And, um, uh, but I wanted to get bef to Woody Allen, whom you um, know well, and you were recently in the news. I mean, you, you've had obviously such an interesting life, met so many interesting people, but you were in like, even we had booked you already to come on and talk about this novel, Daphne, but then you were suddenly in the news. I was reading about you. Um, I think right. even in the, in the, in the um, uh, Daily Mail. Uh, so tell us about your, because I'm reading right. Woody Allen's <laughs> right. book right now, apropos of nothing. And I've got, I thought I should, and I, I've got a lot of thoughts on it, but yeah, you, I you, too. but too the way it tied into, well, first older men and younger women, but also Ronan Farrow, the Me Too reporting. Tell us about your experience, and, and we can put it in that I, context. First of all, I wasn't such great friends with him. Right. That was put in because of Ronan Farrow, okay. and I had written the piece. Oh, yeah, you have to set it up. You set it up. So this was how long ago? Oh, yeah. was two summers ago. I would sometimes, not so often, have dinner with Woody Allen. He usually did not bring Sun Yi. This was about the second time he brought Sun Yi, who struck me as smart. I hope she doesn't watch this. A little chilly. And I suddenly said to her, partly because I forget what I know about Woody Allen, I've never bought into the whole story at all of his fingering or whatever they claimed Dylan. The, the rape I said, of his what? daughter, or the molestation of his daughter, when she yeah. was, what, seven? seven. Five, five, a five, I said, yeah, yeah. Maybe five. I said to Sun Yi, why don't you tell your story? You've never been heard from. And she, and I guess he thought about it for a while, because she had been approached before. And then they decided, they agreed. I did endless interviews. I felt like Cy Hirsch on a lower level as I schlepped Connecticut to interview two ex-housekeepers who told me monstrous details about the relationship between Mia Farrow and Ronan um, including, and I think there were hospital documents that she had his legs, I think I wrote this to you, Megan, or not, that she had his legs broken cosmetically. And then, you know, what are they called? Put in metal. Yeah, metal splints or whatever interior. Yeah, rods. Yeah. This is for the purpose of what? To make and him. when did this happen? Allegedly, to make him taller, make him taller so he could be a political figure. Is that true? Um, I, I, mean, I can't even believe it. Like that's insane. You had, I think it's true. you had, you had. I mean, those I've possible. heard those rumors, but it's just like uh, remarkable if it's true. Well, he claims he that Mia Farrow that. tried to keep nursing Ronan Farrow till eleven or something. She did. She did. Yeah. Very very late. He slept in her bed. I'm not suggesting they had. Yeah. This was the housekeepers who were petrified of Mia Farrow till about 10 or 11. Um, she, he was totally her, her construction. 
You also had a lot of face surgery. That, if, that has been, I don't think everyone goes on about it. I don't actually believe he's Frank Sinatra's son. That's Probably because she did not continue. She did not continue to have a relationship with Frank Sinatra. I met him when he was a boy, when he was still, what was his name? Satchel? Satchel, yeah. Satchel, looked, Satchel Page. He looked much more, I mean, he was a cute looking boy who you could imagine was Woody Allen's son. He also wears very, very blue lenses. When I interviewed Sun Yi and a bit Woody, but mainly Sun Yi, the details about Mia Farrow's treatment of the adopted children, two of whom committed suicide, a third of who a third of whom a third child is missing, were pathological in the extreme. Specifically, her non-interest in these adopted children. And Moses Farrow has come out, it's been paid no attention, I don't know why, he's come out with a long document about how abusive Mia was. Huh. But the reason it was in the news is because this there's a slow fissure in the wall around Ronan, you know, with the Ben Smith article in the Times. Yeah, I'll just summarize that, that, that Ben Smith, who's a now the media columnist, founder of Politico, now the media columnist for New York Times, wrote a piece, I, I'm a little mistrustful of some of the reporting, but I, I get the concept that there's like cracks in the armor of Ronan Barrow that he maybe ex he exaggerated a bit, or, or as, as we were talking about earlier, did not acknowledge any of the complexities in some of these relationships. Oh. Um, but sorry, go on. And, and anyway, that piece came out. So, and that's where that caught you up in this, this controversy. Well, Ben Smith called me and we had an hour conversation and he told me something I didn't even know. He said when I was right, I knew when I had started the piece, Ronan called Adam Moss. I never knew what he said to Adam Moss. Ben Smith did know and said, he said, um, Adam Moss was the, the editor of the New York, uh, New York, New York magazine of New York magazine for whom you were writing this piece two years ago. Just Sorry, to be clear. Yes. Okay. Piece, right. Which many of my well-meaning friends said, don't do it. You'll be tarnished forever. Maybe I was. And Ronan called very early, Adam Moss, and told him, Dave, um, Ben Smith knew this, that um, Sun Yi was mentally not deficient mm -hmm. and shouldn't be listened to. Um, ben Smith also knew that Ronan was bullying throughout the process I maybe, I don't know, not wrongly, maybe it's my pseudo, you know, I must expose <laughs> the injustices of the world, but I watched Ronan, what went on with my piece. I had never experienced anything like it. I've written about other contentious, uh, the Kabbalah C Center mm -hmm. in LA, they threatened to sue the Times. So this when was I like Scientologists or something. This is just yeah. again to make sure people are following. So you had written, you got this exclusive profile of Sun Yi. Right. And it was, I think you were promised it would be on the cover by Adam Moss, the editor. And then Ronan, yeah. what you're saying is that Ben Smith subsequently reported recently that um, the Ronan Farrow got wind of it. And then he, you say bullied Adam Moss, not to, put, to pull it completely or? Yes. Pull it off not the cover? It. Yeah. And, and said because Sun Yi was mentally. No, that was, Sorry. That came very early. The yeah. cover was a later decision. Okay. And what was particularly striking is the magazine was supposed to close on a Wednesday. Somehow Ronan, I don't know who told him, looked up an essay I wrote in a collection called The Fame Lunches 
in which yes. I said I identified with wounded famous people, that I was a non-groupie for non-celebrities. And I said that I had had a lunch or two with Woody Allen and I had been very depressed. And he said, you should get ECT, you know, you know, electroshock therapy. Woody Allen suggested you get electroshock therapy. And I thought, my God, doesn't he realize I'm creative and you could have moods? But he just said, I think you should have. And we didn't, that didn't end. Had it. he had it? No. <laughs> okay. I mean, I, I know Dick Cavett is a big um, proponent. And I was anyway scared of it. Um, yeah. But that was sort of the end. You know, I saw him little. I was never invited to a Christmas, famous Christmas party. I would say he was an acquaintance of some history. Ronan found that piece. I have no idea how. It was included in the fame lunches. It was the title piece. And Ronan either faxed, no one uses faxed any faxes no, anymore. No, I'm only doctor's away. offices, yeah. People in your novel. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, emailed or called New York and said I was a besotted fan. And in response to that, it was very shrewd of him. I said to my editor, if I do this, this will be used to attack the story. I had to change. I've known Woody Allen for over four decades to I've been a good friend of Woody Allen for over four decades, which is not true. Mm -hmm. Ronan then used that to attack the piece, which is why I didn't want to do it, aside from it being untrue. And the last day, they took out everything the housekeeper said. The last day I sat with, which I've also never done. I mean, I wrote stuff for the New Yorker that they vetted, but I didn't sit for three hours with two lawyers, as I did from New York Magazine, who went over every single word. Again, a lot was taken out. The fear of Ronan, I found maybe clarifying. I mean, the abuse of power by someone who's supposedly, you know, a muckraking journalist, but he went to many, and then I was told, I was asked to call Mia Farrow to run the story by her. She didn't ever answer. They said I never ran it by her. Sorry, Danielle, I think the time is coming no, to no, that's, an end. No. So when, when the Ronin thing came up again with Ben Smith, he interviewed me for an hour. He ended up including none of it. And I decided I want to say something about this. That Ronan isn't only not such a great journalist. I hear he's completely rewritten at the New Yorker. I have no idea if that's true. But went to great lengths to stop a woman from talking. Yeah. And I just found it an abuse of power. Well, one of the things- And pretty effective. Right, and one of the things I, I thought pertaining to his reporting, which was um, when the Harvey Weinstein trial was going on, and there was, we did an, we did a, we talked about it on the podcast, but there was so little coverage of the kind that you would think this trial of the century would be. Like to hear the details of the testimony, which look, Harvey Weinstein views power as a pig where no one is defending Harvey Weinstein. And I'm sure it's a great thing. He ends up in prison, whatever. But again, this nuance that the, the testimony of the, I mean, if there was what, 99 women that Pharaoh found and you end up with these two you know, cases know. that are so flimsy. And it's not to say Harvey Weinstein didn't do all this stuff, but as a legal case, it was, it was, it was shocking, but it was, and I think with Woody Allen reading his book, I mean, I think his, the truly wicked, and I use that word carefully, the truly wicked thing he did 
was to break his pact as a stepfather to a child. It, it doesn't, you know, the, the, we, we all are pretty certain he has a creepy interest in very, very young girls, which from his movies. And, right. and so that, you know, that doesn't resound to his defense. But then to just- His stepfatherness of, Sun, of Sun Yi? Yes. I mean, he wasn't, she was not his stepdaughter technically, oh. but you no, mean- No, but, but you're, you're, you're raiding the nest. De facto. And, and, yeah. and you are supposed to, I mean, even though, look, I, get, I think you learn from this book how crazy he is, how crazy their whole relationship was. And, and now we hear from you, Daphne, how crazy she, you know, the household was. But in the end, look, Sun Yi was what, 19 or something to- 21? She was 20. To his what? 50 something? Talk about 30 years between yeah. rich men. But you know, no. okay, fine. Like you can have your opinions on that. But I, I felt that he- No, I agree. He did betray a, a, a pact. And, and I can see that would drive I any woman- never saw her. Yeah, but I can see that that would drive any woman insane. Like if if that was my like not only not only have you cheated on I me, agree. you've cheated on me with my daughter. Like that's pretty that's pretty Greek, you know, like of the Greek mythology. That that just but no, also I, Yeah. Sorry. Anyway, that was my takeaway of it. Right. I'm not excusing it. I said in my piece it's very morally questionable what he did. Sun Yi said she agreed that it was a betrayal of Mia Farrow. Yeah. Woody Allen, who I described in my piece, which thank goodness he never reads anything about himself, as Aspergian. Mm -hmm. He doesn't really relate. So I once said to him, instead of being angry at Mia Farrow, she had many affairs, she treated him badly, Instead of being angry, I think he ended up doing this. Yeah. And I don't think it's forgivable. I will say on their behalf, they have an excellent marriage. Well, and soon Yi, it would also be her revenge if, if the household was yes. as you described. Because that's a pretty wicked thing. Or not, I don't want to say wicked for the daughter because it's more psychologically interesting right. and fraught. Well, one of the things I take away from his book, not so much as Aspergian, but it's why, my opinion, I don't think he's as good a filmmaker as he was a comedian. And it's because he's really not interested in anybody else. <laughs> and, you know, okay. and, 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 and he has this way of like, if he wants something, he doesn't, I want it. You know, he doesn't have this moral. So odd you zone. say this because he has a modest, demeanor right behind which is a diva exactly but it's yes. hard mm. it's hard to read him that way he's yes. very used to calling all the shots yeah very it's i mean what is one of his most famous lines is one of his most famous sentiments why do people keep getting into these relationships why because you you need the eggs like you just want it full stop period right right, right. that was right. what was behind that line true and the book is very True. funny and entertaining, but it is, yeah, there is a little bit, oh, okay, uh, all right. It shows uh, very little for a man who's been, whatever you think of psychoanalysis, for a man who's been in psychoanalysis. <laughs> so little self, well, yeah, yeah. But for, for 60 years, how long has he been in it? <laughs> well, I, I beat him, sadly, but he has, <laughs> so little self-awareness yeah that's yeah. what comes through in the book right and that's what comes through as a creative talent that's you also you also see that um all right well, well one of the you. moments in your piece oh no go ahead no, megan sorry mind. no one more oh, question i was just I was, gonna I was say no death no this gets to the this gets to the uh, Asperger thing just really quickly. Like one of the moments I remember in your New York Magazine piece, Daphne, was when he's describing meeting Mia Farrow and finding her attractive or what brought them together. And doesn't he say something like, well, you know, she seemed, she presented herself well and yeah, she yeah. seemed like she had it together. So therefore I'm going to partner with her. It was so right. clinical. Right. Yeah. Remarkable. That's true. Amazing. Okay. Well, I, I, 
I hope, I hope, I always love we having you. We have a whole episode on this. I, I know, I know. I feel like we, we, we have all these plans to talk about so many things, but I hope, Daphne, we can have you back on Femsplaining because it's, you're just endlessly I interesting. Love, love the novel. And Megan, just a quick plug, Thank you're, you. you're starting your own podcast, correct? Yes, I'm starting my own podcast, um, hopefully at the end of July, and it's called The Unspeakable, and it's an interview show. I'm going to just be having free-ranging, long conversations, just like this, as a matter of <laughs> fact. Oh, it's so, your competition, um, so we won't plug you, Megan. I'm not, no, I, uh, we, there, can't, there can't be enough of them. Uh, we need more of these, so I'm going to be talking to, you know, all kinds of people, writers, scholars, scientists. I love the name. It. I love so, both names. I yes. think Fem's, how did you think of it? It's such a- We went through it's a- like mansplaining. Yeah, yeah. What? Yeah, yeah it was okay. sort of a, an irreverent take on mansplaining. And when we have male guests I on, oh. we do introduce them as mansplainers, which some don't get it. We're being fondly saying that. And right. anyway. Right. All right. Well, thank you both. Uh, and uh, so stay safe and good luck. Congratulations, with Daphne. Novel. Thank you. Thank you.